Brennan and Honesty Brennan asks one of the most profound questions of our generation. Do you think white people would understand if they were if they have been born slaves and if their history was ours? So the book What If White People Were Slaves introduces a tale of American history that will shock your system. The book represents storytelling at its finest, but in the waters that no one has ever dared to tread until now. What If White People Were Slaves provides readers with an opportunity to walk in each other's shoes. Don't go away, we'll be right back. If you're just joining us, welcome to the Writer's Corner live show. I'm your host, Bridgette Limbanda from Cape Town in South Africa, and our stream is made possible by Creative Edge, StreamYard, and BeLive Media. So a special warm welcome to you, our audience, whether you are joining us over on Facebook, on Twitter, on LinkedIn, on YouTube, um, and also if you're joining us over on Amazon Live, do know that we are watching the comments in real time. So if you have a question or a comment about our show or a question for our author today, you are more than welcome to do so in the comments. And um, if you're brand new to the show, we've been going for over three and a half years. We would also love to give you a shout out. So don't be shy. In today's show, we're going to be talking to Indy Brennan. Um, and we're looking forward to that conversation, a very, very interesting conversation and topic. But also on the Writer's Corner Live Show, we're all about helping you level up. If you are an author, um, we are still under, well, thankfully, most of the restrictions of the pandemic have gone away. But moving forward, we foresee that things are going to remain hybrid. And a lot of authors are still releasing their books um, virtually. And so there are a couple of recommendations that we've got for you if you are still working virtually, as most of us are doing. And one of the things that I recommend is the Logitech Brio camera, um, which is what I use myself. And I know that my co-host, Mary, who will join me in just a minute, also uses the Logitech Brio camera. So it comes highly recommended. Um, it uses the trademarked right light hdr technology which means it'll automatically adjust your lighting conditions so you don't have to be a lighting expert one thing less to worry about when you're doing your book release online right and then for um audio i use the samsung um, studio condenser microphone it's incidentally the world's first um, USB condenser microphone and it's got a solid die cast construction which means that it reduces noise vibrations and therefore is ideal for people going live but not everybody wants to have um, a, a big microphone and you don't need to so but I do recommend you get one other than what's built into your phone or what's built into your computer or laptop um, and so the other thing that I recommend is the Rode Lavalier which is a lapel microphone. So whatever you do, do get something because you want people to be able to hear you clearly. So the Rode Lavalier comes um, recommended. And then the other thing, you know, a lot of people use their phones to go live and there's nothing wrong with that. A quick tip, make sure that you put your phone into landscape mode and that way, that's the way that you avoid those black lines that you see on the side. People often wonder, why do I have black lines? because your phone is um, not in landscape mode. And the other thing that um, I highly recommend is that you don't try and stream or do a book promotion with your phone in your hand. Do use a tripod to stabilize it. Otherwise, it has the effect of making people feel just a little bit um, seasick, and you don't want that. So what I recommend is 
some sort of a stabilizer when you're promoting your book like the um, DJI Osmo, which uh, is a gimbal. Or you could use something like the iographer um, on top of your tripod just to make sure that it is stabilized, that your hands are free, that you can hold your book in your hand and talk about your book um, with confidence without worrying that your phone's going to come crashing down on you while you talk. So before we invite the amazing Indy Brennan to talk about his book today, my friend and co-host is Mary Elizabeth Jackson. Mary is a special needs and disabilities advocate. She's also a ghostwriter and an award-winning author herself. And um, do check out her latest book called Cheers from Heaven, along with Thornton Klein. So let me invite my amazing co-host to the screen. Mary, how are you today? I am um, super excited to be here, and um, we like to feature authors of all from all over the world and different topics and different subjects, so we're excited about that, but I'm doing really good. I'm excited to be here, and um, we have beautiful blue sky, which always puts a smile on somebody's face, doesn't it? It does mine. <laughs> it definitely does. It definitely does. So for those of you um, who have never met our featured author for today, Indy Brennan, is the host of the very famous Book Slam on Clubhouse. And we'll ask that's how, a little that's bit. That's how we met. Yes, I met him there. So or that's how we got to know each other was through there. So it's a really, really great, uh, it, it's a great uh, room on Clubhouse because you know they're all called rooms. But yeah, he's done a really great job with them, with it and with all the guests that have come on. We'll ask him about that. Um, he's also one of the most foremost leaders in the increasingly popular uh, audiobook production world. Very, very important because I see a lot of uh, some authors will do their own audiobooks and others will find a, a professional person to do their audiobooks. Right. He is also a master business development strategist and the author of the top 51 business hacks for 2021 um and it those business hacks are not just for 2021 we're all we're in 2022 um but those are great business hacks moving forward in the virtual world that we are today some, some great suggestions in there um and today we're going to be talking about his game-changing novel what if white people were slaves so without fur any further ado let's invite him to join us on screen Yes, I mean, dive right in. Hi, do you like that entrance? Yeah, I love it. <laughs> I was wondering who you were talking about, but no, it was great. <laughs> Is the guy behind you? Awesome. No, I'm no, no, no. It's fantastic. I appreciate yeah. it. Yeah, awesome. We're great so job. excited to have you. You know what I love? And we need to introduce, I don't think I've introduced Tim Bergetti to Darshan McAway. We need to introduce you guys to each other because you guys are like, you guys are just rocking it, both of you. And mm -hmm. and Darshan is a friend of ours, and you know he's an entrepreneur, books, clone shirts. You know he does all kinds of stuff, and right. he's just a go getter, right. just like you are. And I, I think you guys. But it's it's so much fun to talk to you and and to see all the things that you're doing and to collaborate and be and participate as well. So we want to just we're going to dive right in and just get started, so we Perfect. don't waste any time. <laughs> absolutely absolutely you know i know a lot of people may want to shy away about the you know the, the, the topic of your book today and we'll get to, we'll get to that a bit later but mm -hmm. uh, i'm in cape town in south africa and having grown up through the apartheid years um you know storytelling is so so very very important yeah. crucial yeah. and it's important that we get the stories right because if you don't know where you're coming from um it's very hard to find direction forward i agree uh, i agree 
you know so so the topic of your book is very close to my heart um i must say but now before we talk a little bit about your book today you are the host of the very very successful book slam over on clubhouse tell us a little bit about how that got started i'm curious it's funny because the book slam got started first of all thank you for uh allowing me to be on the platform great plat great uh show I'm, I'm looking at the uh, presentation it's awesome but uh i got the the book slam was actually started on a whim hmm. i'm an author as you know uh the, what if white people were slaves was actually written a few years ago i just released it recently um even the top 51 business hacks but i was speaking with a client friend of mine and clubhouse used to be a lot more restricted back then and we heard that you could now open your own rooms. So on a whim, she tried to do it. She couldn't do it. Ironically, I attempted and it worked. So I said, hey, let's start the book slam. And that was pretty much how it, it was no, nothing more than that. And since then, it has been explosive. We've had people on the book slam from all over the world. I mean, from Australia to Atlanta. Uh, we have people in the UK who will actually log in at one or two o'clock in the morning just to perform their live read or just to listen. So it's it's been absolutely awesome. I, I love the book slam. And it's a very comfortable environment. I encourage people to come out. It doesn't, it isn't, authors are nervous when they first get there, many of them, but once they come in, they're very comfortable. It's, it's very familial. So, you know, it's it's great. It's great. Well, and you're, you're very, um... Your voice is very calming, so you help people feel comfortable. You know, well, you thank you. Have a, you're <laughs> welcome. You have just a very easygoing, you know, sound about you. Some people sound more stern or more withdrawn, or you know, a little hype over it. But mm -hmm. you're you're just kind of you're right there in the middle, so it makes mm -hmm. people feel more comfortable. And and I think you're comfortable in what you're doing. I mean, that's how you and I met. Was back in October. Right. And it's right. You messaged me the day, and I know the date because I launched my book that day. Wow. wow. <laughs> it was like seven in the morning, and I get this message from this from you I didn't even know you yet and I was like oh my gosh I'd love to do this and so um you know it's a great platform I've been able to get on every once in a while I would like to be on more often uh, mm -hmm. to support other authors because I've met some really great authors uh, yeah. on your platform mm -hmm. and it's nice to connect um and um so we you know how do you feel that the success of uh, the book slam on clubhouse is added to your authority as a business leader and author and would you recommend we know you're going to recommend that authors get more involved mm -hmm. um, yeah. as a way to promote but um you know how do you want to you know how are you going to recommend that where do you advertise i mean i get your advertisements mm -hmm. and i try mm -hmm. to always share them out mm -hmm. um but yeah how do you how do you feel like it's added to your success as a, you know an authority in business and being an author in business and being author and especially uh, uh you mentioned earlier about me being uh into audiobooks developing an audiobook engineer in business and as an author it has helped improve my brand again it was completely inadvertent but it, it's really helped uh improve the brand because i am literally meeting i am meeting um Indy, we don't have any sound. Um, I think you were trying to put your phone off there. So now we can't hear yet. you. Yet. Technology giving us a bit of a, a twister here, but um, <laughs> give us a second. Indy will rejoin us now, now. So stay with us. Don't go anywhere. We'll get this figured out. You know, sometimes mm -hmm. technology does challenge us. But um, we'll get yeah, the there. gremlins are here. The gremlins have come to visit us. Um, yeah. So, Indy, just join us as soon as you can. Yeah. So we can talk about the, the book slam is every Tuesday night at 8 p.m. Eastern on Clubhouse. And Clubhouse is now open to. There he is. Yay. <laughs> My apologies. Um, yeah. Well, where was that? Um, uh, it's it's the authority. Authority that it gives you, yeah. yeah. It's helped quite a bit because uh, even with the audio books, the audio books were launched. Everything that happened with the book slam almost 
it, nothing was really planned. That's the strange part. I'm real big on planning on uh, book, book uh, what do you call it, business plans and life plans and that type of stuff. Everything was, well, nothing was planned with the book slip. The audio books, I promote audio books heavily. Reasoning me, I, my background is also tech and the music industry. So, you know, I know the effect that music and sound can have. So when people came in on, on the book slam, I just encourage them to be on, to, to, to make sure to get the audio books out there. They're much more immersive. They're much more engaging than uh, just reading because unfortunately we just don't have the time anymore. But uh, through the through the book slam, uh, I've gotten contacted by a, a I mean an abundance of individuals that I otherwise possibly wouldn't have connected with. Um, and also, I think because of the platform, it's established a certain degree of trust that I uh, normally would have had to really take time to foster or to build. And in this case, it's just it's just worked out fantastically. So now the book slam has been great for me. The audio books, uh, the audio books I create are we refer to as enhanced audio books because they're not just audio books. The audio books that we we develop have music and sound effects. So suddenly you can hear the children playing, you can hear the door creaking, you can hear the wind blowing. And your mind is amazing because it begins to construct this atmosphere, this environment, just from these these sounds, the, the music. And suddenly you are there. Uh, that's that's one of the reasons I love uh, the audiobooks. But no, it's been fantastic for for business. I've gotten clients, more clients than I can even keep up with now. Mm, you're engaging all the senses, so you're doing a good job. Yeah. That's, yeah. that's awesome. Yeah, yeah, it's absolutely fantastic. It is. That's almost going back to the radio days, you know, where you used to be mm -hmm. glued to the radio, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. and you know, just all your senses were engaged because exactly. You were just in your mind's eye, see all these things, mm -hmm. um, you know, happening just by listening to the sounds. That's yeah. amazing. Yeah, yeah. The again, the mind is the human mind is just absolutely awesome. It hears these sounds and it it envisions the ocean, or it sees the field, or it 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 it, it, it you begin to envision the children playing. You know, or you you're at the verge of being attacked, as in you know some cases within my book. So it's a, it's an awesome awesome exchange. I yeah. love audiobooks, love them. Mm. So uh, I'm curious. So you you wrote um, fifth one successful business tips for 2021, winning strategies for getting your business into the game, and then you you've also written. Um, what if white people were slaves now mm -hmm. so are you saying you wrote, you wrote what if white people were slaves first and then you wrote 51 successful business tips but you didn't yes. release the mm -hmm. book until right. after is that correct right that actually what happened was um what if white people were slaves was originally released a couple of years ago but under a different title it was titled uh, reciprocal um and it didn't do as well under reciprocal in part because honestly people didn't understand what it meant right there was uh, no it, 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 right right i had to go through too much explaining explanation in order to get people to understand so it was rebranded um last year as what if white people were slaves and that exploded uh because the 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 question behind reciprocal was what if white people were slaves so again, there was it was a still a slight disconnect, but by just eliminating reciprocal and just bringing out the question, it it was it's been awesome. Uh, I've gotten incredible feedback. Go ahead. So so that to me speaks to the importance of uh, of the title of your book because if it's not oh, yeah. if it's not descriptive, if it's if it doesn't kind of ring a bell with people. Uh, immediately, it's not going to have the kind of impact that you wish it to have. No. That's a no. title can a make or break a book. Of, it can. Of, yeah. Of the titles. Now, I want to know um, what made you want to write this book. Was it was it mm. with intention to to provoke people, or what is it that you wanted 
let me rephrase it. What did you want your readers to discover by reading this book? I wanted people to understand. I, I, I wanted, I, I think back to Jane Elliott's uh, Brown Eye, Blue Eye experiment where she, uh, when it, it was the day, it was, I believe, uh, in April of uh, 1968, Martin, Martin Luther King had just been killed. She noticed that her five, fifth grade students were not, um, they didn't feel anything, which was a reflection immediately of the parents. Uh, again, because in 1968, there were literally two different worlds. Even today within our society, I've asked a lot of people, uh, you know, how do you feel about Syria or Somalia, Americans? And they all look at me crazy. But they look at me crazy because there's no connection. They, they don't understand the, the relevance of that question. With uh, what if white people were slaves, it's the same thing. There are cultures and communities and groups within this country that feel sorry for George Floyd, or they'll, they'll feel sorry for Sandra Bland or Trayvon Martin or Eric Garner. But they, it, it's, there's a disconnect. They don't understand why this other group is so, uh, so, so traumatized by this, by this experience. So what, what we do, what the book has done, it's switched roles. So when you begin to talk about slavery and the effect of slavery uh, and the long-term effect of slavery, by reading this, it begins to establish a, a brand new foundation. It's a, it's a position that, um, in particular, uh, white people and black people within this country have never been in. Uh, when a white person can actually, in the book, uh, there are, there, there's, there's some pretty graphic stuff that happens. And it's, it has been, I've gotten uh, DMs where people have been offended. The intent has never been to offend anyone. It's actually to broaden your way of thinking, to expand the way that you think and to initiate uh, a heightened level of empathy for your 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 kinsman, your your fellow American, or or your 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 neighbor. It doesn't even have to just be American, but by doing it, it's been it's been a great experience. It's been a great experiment. Um, when you get offended by what if white people were slaves, you are innately or inadvertently agreeing that I don't agree with what happened even though you don't realize it, even though you not, may not realize it consciously. And this is just book one of seven. That's what I was going to ask yeah. you. I see the book. Yeah. So what yeah. time period you're starting at 1810. I know this is, uh, mm -hmm. you know, this is, uh, you're, what, how far are you going? Like 1810 to, to current times, to current times. Okay. I so want, you're, go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. I want people to, I want people to just be able to imagine how things may have been, again, when you start thinking about the, the Renaissance period, the civil rights movement, um, the Reagan era, um, there are a lot of, you know, Reagan's, you know, and I don't want to get into politics too heavily, but there are a lot of people that don't care for Reagan uh, on one side of the fence because Reagan literally did not help a lot of people on one side and he helped a lot of people on the other. At least his, I, 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 we give too much credit to the presidents, the administration. Uh, and that's, I just want to help people to uh, be able to identify, and more importantly, just to think. If we thought before we spoke, before we reacted, before we criticized, I think it would be a great, it, we'd be able to, we'd be a much better society. We'd be in a much different place. And, yes. and your, your, your role is turning into whether you even knew it or not is, is an awareness expander. Exactly. And, and, and helping people. There is such a big difference between awareness and judgment. It's exactly. two totally different things because mm -hmm. awareness is acknowledgement or knowledge of something with, with the, without the judgment. Right. So um, how long, like how much research did you do for this? Like how deep did you go and how long did it take you to write this book? I wrote book one and two in 45 days. Wow. Okay. And it was, as far as research, I am an African American man in America. <laughs> you know, the research came from. I mean, I've always been a, a, a somewhat of a. a, a, a I, I enjoy history. Mm -hmm. um, so I've always, in, in you know, I've always been a part of this organization or that organization as far as civil rights. Uh, but it actually just came from 
personal ex experience or things that I heard other people talk about and just switching those roles around. That's literally all I did. I have a, I have a gift where I can hear or I can envision something and just take it there. I stress to everyone, I don't hate white people. <laughs> okay. This is, this is basically to, it's not even written for that purpose. Again, it's not written to anger anybody. Uh, it's written to, like I said, educate. It's written to uh, expand your thinking, uh, expand your sense of awareness. Because again, if we did that, it would be so much better. Uh, well, everybody would be able to play in the uh, the same uh, yeah. sandbox with all the toys we could share. Yeah. And I, yeah. I always say yeah. our planet is a sandbox, and we really need to, you know, we need to understand yeah. we can play together. It's okay. It is okay. Mm -hmm. The beginning of the book was written. Um, the book starts out, and it's just describing a an area of the South, and it's very descriptive but there's nothing attached to it. I didn't want people to, even though the book is called what it's, it's titled, What If White People Were Slaves? I didn't want people to immediately understand where we were going with it. Uh, I got the idea, honestly, from Richard Wright, who wrote Baby, uh, who wrote Black Boy, you know, back in the Renaissance period. Amazing, amazing author. Uh, because in the beginning of his book, he's describing a baby. And it, it shows how at a certain point that child, when the baby's first born, they don't identify with race or religion or anything like that. They're just a baby. And it, be, it, it as the baby gets older, it begins to see the associations, make the connections. And these connections are unfortunately reinforced oftentimes by society. And that's it, and that's one of the things with what if white people were slaves? That's how I wanted to open it up. I wanted you to start it out with something familiar. You know, we've we've all seen Gone with the Wind or Roots, and a part of it is just something that all of us can relate to. You know, uh, sipping on a glass of sun, you know, sun ripened sweet tea. You know, uh, the grass blowing and the kids playing. You don't even talk about color, but then it slowly goes into the essence of the experience. And uh, that's where uh, it picks up and gets very uh, interesting. But the book, it, it was incredibly fun to write, believe it or not. And it was an experience for me because I literally took my mind to places I had never even taken. It. I'm sure. India, I've still got a thousand questions and mm -hmm. I want to interview mm -hmm. you. I want to interview you again. <laughs> I know we gotta have we need to have Indy back I on. A, I need an hour with you, Indy, mm -hmm. for this. I need an hour with you. Seriously. <laughs> I, need, I need to have you back. I need to interview you again. Um so I just want to quickly ask, can you read us, you know, we're out of time, but can you read us a snippet from the book just to give people a sense? Yeah, yeah. I um, I let me see. I find uh, so for anyone who's just joined us now, we're talking to Indy Brennan, and we're talking about his. Um, it's not. It's not his latest book. He's re-released the book. Um, the book is called What If White People Were Slaves? And we're looking forward to just a brief snippet from the book. Okay. But we looked up, and before we knew it, we had made it to the bend leading home. It was one small section of the market that at this time of day, considering the position of the sun, was hidden just beyond the sight of most of those around us. It had already been abandoned for the night, but as we made this trip that we had made more than a thousand times before, off in a crevice and seemingly resting in the darkness of its covering, we both gradually noticed a familiar shadow. I don't know what made me, but strangely for a moment, I considered the tales told by the elders, remembering the hyenas. He stood there, and it seemed as if that moment just hung in the air, still as a parker on the coat rack of, a time, of time. And he stood there, silent, eerily unmoving, 
still as if he had been drawn into the backdrop of some famous painting. What was unnerving was that I could barely see his eyes. They seemed to be almost masked by his unsettling darkness. But at the same time, it felt as if I could somehow sense his eyes roving my skin, causing my flesh to bump up sort of like you suddenly, you suddenly like when you suddenly become cold. But in this case, it was more like having a throng of spiders crawling creepily across my skin. But what was wrong with me? This was iffy. If it was in many ways practically family, like a surrogate uncle to many of us. This wasn't just some caucus slave. This was Daddy Okoyuk's friend and adopted brother. This was ridiculous. My imagination was getting the best of me. I had to be imagining this feeling. I guess that I had probably heard the stories for so long that they must have started really getting to me. But then I happened to glance over at Yuri as if I had almost forgotten for a moment that she had been standing there beside me all the while. You see, mostly for all of our young lives, if I ever felt myself shaken or afraid of something, anything, Yuri was there like this unexpected but very much needed lifeline. She had always been my beacon of hope and remembering of every wonderful possibility, regardless of whatever situation we had happened to find ourselves in. And it was a lot of it. We were kids, but I had grown to love and admire Yuri more and more for her courage that seemed to have no end. I have to admit, I became stronger through Yuri's presence. But on that particular night, Yuri's face looked in a way that I had never seen. For the first time in our short lives, when I looked into Yuri's eyes, I saw something I had never known often but it seemed was never a part of Yuri's character. I found something in her eyes that seemed to somehow reach down into the very pit of her soul. For the first time I could actually ever remember when I looked into Yuri's eyes, I saw complete and unmitigated fear. In fact, there was something about that particular moment that seemed to be disturbingly familiar to Yuri. There was something in Ify's manner that Yuri had known before and that she seemed to fear ever known again. As I looked at my best friend, who I knew as well as I believed I could ever know myself, I noticed within her stare that there was visceral recognition, a knowing that had seeped to her core. While I was attempting to dismiss my own fear as just silliness, Yuri appeared to be all too familiar with the sin of evil suddenly drifting on the currents of that moment in time. Wow. That's, you're a great storyteller. Oh, thank you. <laughs> you are. I mean, you're very captivating, Andy. Thank you. Yeah. Thank I think you. We, I we were right there with him, weren't we, Bridget? <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. Oh, my goodness. Oh, my goodness. Oh, my goodness. Um, I've, I've got to tell you, um, over on Amazon Live, um, Cook for Diva says, thank you for that reading. We've never actually had somebody say thank you for that reading. And I think that speaks to just how captivating you were in, you. in reading that. So thank you so much for that. We're out of thank time. You. We could really have kept you on the show for an entire hour. I know. We only do 30 minutes, so we need to have you back, okay? I'd love to be back. Love to yeah. be back. This is a great think, show. Thank you so much. We love it. And you know what? Ours started on a whim, too, Indy. So, really? You know, yeah. <laughs> July 2017, we wanted to do a show together. We were friends, mm -hmm. and it was like, hey, let's do an author show. And then here we are. So, and then we That's are, cool. you know, we've created a network, Writers yeah. writers Network. Um, and so we've got uh, one show under, you know, that we've had join us and we're mm -hmm. looking at another show. So we're trying to grow this author network. We're really excited about it. Fantastic. Fantastic. It's great. It's been great. Thank you so much for allowing me to be on the platform. It's a you big, know. big pleasure. Thank you for joining us. And thank you to everyone who's joined us over on, um, I almost said Clubhouse. What I meant to say was Amazon <laughs> Live. That's tonight at eight. Yes. Tonight at eight o'clock. Yeah. 
Facebook, LinkedIn, YouTube, Twitter. Um, you all are amazing. It was lovely having you join us today. Take care, stay safe, and we'll see you next week on another episode of the Writer's Corner live show. Stay well, everyone. Bye for now. Mm-hmm.